I am so thankful to be here with you this morning. Thank you for being here. Those of you here and those watching online, excited to dive into the word of the Lord with you. And I'm praying that you would be encouraged as we have this opportunity to go before him. Two years ago, before our youngest son, Lincoln, was born, uh, my wife and I took our kids on a trip, their first trip to Disney World. It's a lot of fun. They loved it. They loved seeing all of the characters uh, they see in like the TV shows and movies that they watch. And Jess and I really love seeing like their faces light up when they see like all the different things. They see the rise. They see the characters. Uh, the joy as they get to experience everything that is the magic of Disney World. You know, when I was younger, I don't think I'd ever say that the greatest joy of going to a theme park, particularly Disney World, would be to see the joy in other people, right? Because when I'm younger, you know, paying for Disney, you know, Disney World and parents paying for Disney World, I want to get the most money out of it. I want to ride as many rides as possible, right? Because I'm in it for me, right? I want to ride as many rides as possible and do as much as possible. Just go, 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 right? Do as much as you can to get the most out of the trip. But for my kids, now that being a dad, being a parent, a joy, the greatest joy is just seeing the fun that they have. More than just riding the rides and stuff, just seeing the joy in their hearts. See, a lot can change in a short amount of time. Six years ago, before our eldest son, Lucas, was born, Jess and I took our first trip as a married couple to Disney. We had fast passes to all the rides, like some of our favorites being Space Mountain, uh, Expedition Everest, Rock and Roller Coaster. And it was great because if you have a fast pass, you're able to skip like the long regular lines. And that's awesome because you can just keep going through. Like you pass people and they're still standing in the same spot, but you've already ridden the ride, right? When you're standing in the line, you're not, you're not really fond of that. But when you have a fast pass though, it's really good. It's really good, right? And so we were able to ride a ton of rides. But if you fast forward to our trip with our kids, now those fast passes are all for Dumbo, right? And if you've been to Disney World, or if you haven't been to Disney World, let me give you an idea of what Dumbo is, okay? So you may have seen Dumbo before, you know, the elephant in the movie, right? So the ride is literally, you know, a bunch of Dumbos, like the elephants, and you get in, and it goes up, and it goes down, and it spins in a circle very slowly. That's Dumbo. That's what our fast pass was for. And it's not just Dumbo, right? It was every other kid's ride that literally at Disney World, they're all the same. All of our fast passes were for a ride that resembled Dumbo that all they did was go up, down, and spin in a circle. <laughs> That's a lot different from having a fast pass to all the other like rides You know, people pay so much money to go and to do. But it, The reason why I say that is the change that comes, right? The change that comes just from being a parent, that it it doesn't even matter that we're riding Dumbo 300 times, right, with our kids. It, It does not matter because I want my kids to have the best time of their lives. I want them to remember those types of trips. I want them to remember things. So my joy is found in what my kids see and the joy that they experience a lot can change. So today I want to spend our time together this morning and talk about change. And I want to start by you thinking about as many things as possible that have changed since you were a kid. Let's say since you were five years old, how much has changed? Now for some of you, you can, I mean, it's already like blowing your mind. Like, Nick, I can tell you, there's a lot that's changed. A lot of things that we've seen, a lot of things that we've experienced. There's the technological advances. We had uh, three weeks ago at Rock, I was showing the kids like floppy disks and fax machines, and it was a part of our game, and they had no idea. They were like, what's it? What's a VHS rewinder? I don't, what is that? What's Blockbuster? What? Like, they had no idea. And I'm going, guys, really? Like, come on. Like, you don't know? Like, you know, beepers? You have any? They're like, beepers? What was that? Like, they have no idea, right? A lot can change over just even a small amount of time. So kind of help you out. Think about three big changes that have happened in your life. Mine, my first one is that I met Jesus Christ and accepted him as my Lord and Savior. It changed my life. Second, I married the love of my life, Jess. And then we were blessed to have three children, Lucas, Liam, and Lincoln. See, we are a people of change, even though a lot of times we don't like change, right? Sometimes we're not huge fans of it, but the world has been shaped to where it is today because of change. Think about it. What if the fathers of our nation didn't meet up to fight against the tyranny 
of Great Britain? What if no one stood up against the injustice to slaves? What if no one thought of taking an image and projecting it on a screen where we get TV, where we get movies? What if no one thought of actually being able to talk to someone over long distances, where we get the telephone, and you get the cell phone, right? And you make it portable, you make it equipped with internet, and then you give it a GPS to save all of us from either, you know, bringing out the paper maps that my dad always pressured me. Like, I'm telling you, riding with my dad, dad, I love you if you're watching this. Riding with my dad and being handed a paper map is one of the most stressful situations as a kid I remember being put in. I'm just being honest. It was so stressful. And I'm like, what, how do I even close? Like, I don't even know how to close it back. You know, where are we going? You know, he's like, it's right there. It's marked on the map. And I was like, marked on where? You know, <laughs> I have no, thank you, Lord. GPS and telephone, you know, cell phones. We're able to have that now. So my dad and I won't get lost and he doesn't have to pressure, put the pressure on me to read a, you know, paper map, right? But just thinking like all the stuff that we've been through, change is a part of our world. It's a part of who we are. But as we consider change this morning, no matter how big or small in the world or in our lives, nothing, listen to me, church family, nothing compares to the change that our Lord Jesus brings to us. Nothing in this world, what it can offer and all the different things that you've seen take place physically, just thinking of McDonough and how much it's changed. I've been here for 10 years now, graduated from high school, came here, and all of the change that's happened, I completely try to avoid Highway 20, you know, during the day just because of how crazy it is with traffic. I know y'all know about the traffic, but for me, is they've seen so much change, right? But nothing, listen to me, church family, nothing in this world, and the changes that we've experienced physically that we see compares to the eternity that is offered to us through Jesus Christ and what he does for us. His life, the change that he brings to us is so much greater than anything this world can offer to us. And that impacts us forever and impacts our families and impacts those that we're around. So as we take a a few moments today, and if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 13. My prayer as we look at this scripture is that you would remember the gospel. You would remember what Jesus has done for you personally, done for us corporately. How he has changed your life more than the world, what he has done for you. And I pray it would be a sweet encouragement, a reminder of how Jesus met you right where you were, right? Met you right where you are and where he can maybe meet you today. Wherever you are, whether you know Christ or maybe you've known him since you were eight years old, or maybe you're here today, you've never really had a relationship with God. You've never experienced life change, never experienced the new creation in Christ as Paul talks about. In Corinthians, today my prayer is that you would experience it because Jesus loves you. Jesus is chasing after you. He wants you to know that nothing that you have done in your life would ever keep him from loving and pursuing you. Absolutely nothing would keep him from loving and pursuing and giving his life for you. He's running to meet you today to give you grace and mercy and hope. All you have to do It's just simply turn and believe and accept it. Acts chapter 13, I'll give you a little context before we read the scripture together. The book of Acts begins where the gospels end. The gospels focus on the work of Christ for God's glory. And the book of Acts focuses on the work of the disciples for God's glory. Think about it like this. The gospels proclaim the finished work of Jesus on the cross And the book of Acts shows us the unfinished work of the church. The Great Commission is still very active and alive for us today. It's something the church is still proclaiming. It's something we should still personally, as believers, as Christians, we should be doing. So this is what Acts shows us, the unfinished work of the church. Acts picks up where Jesus ascended. He completed his mission. He leaves his followers to complete the great commission to tell everyone about the love that God has for us, about what he's done for us to make disciples. So where we find ourselves today is how we understand 
what Jesus has called us to. What Paul was proclaiming the gospel, that we as believers, not a a church in a building per se, but the body of Christ, people who have been changed by Jesus, that is what the church is. This is what Paul does. He proclaims the gospel, how Jesus has changed his life. Take a moment and consider who Paul was before he was saved, before his name was changed to Paul. His name was Saul. He was a religious Jew. He was a zealot. He was passionate about his faith. He also was a persecutor of Christians. He imprisoned believers. He also put Christians to death and approved of it. You think of the first martyr of the church. His name was Stephen. He was there and he approved of Stephen's death as people were throwing rocks and stoned him. This man, that is the same guy approving of that death This is who's speaking the love of God today when we read this scripture. Remember that. I think it weighs so heavy that when you look at Paul's life, you see a change take place. It's the same thing with us. When we meet Jesus, you can't walk away from Jesus unchanged in some way. So to give you an example, look at Paul. He was living proof. He lived to tell others about him. So let's do, let's read verses 26 through 31 together of Acts chapter 13. This is Paul speaking. He says, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him, Jesus. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he appeared to those who'd come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people." So give you a little background of where Paul is and what he's doing, a little bit more of a context. Paul was saved in Acts chapter 9. Jesus met him, spoke him, gave him a calling, saved his life. He confessed, believed. He's been encouraged. He's been equipped by the church from chapters 10 through chapters 12 of Acts. And now he's been sent out on the very first missionary journey to tell everyone about Jesus with a disciple named Barnabas. Now he had been to a couple places before this, but he finds himself at Antioch in Sidia. And they go to the synagogue where the Jews would meet and would worship, right? And at the end of the service, the man who's leading the service stands up and says, if anyone has any words of encouragement to say, now's the time. So guess what Paul does? Paul stands up. He's got a load of encouragement to tell them, right? He's got a message of the gospel to share with them, and that is exactly what he does. If you would turn right just the next page maybe, look at verses 17 of Acts chapter 13, and this is what Paul says. After he stands up, after that man says to speak encouragement, this is what he says, the end of verse 16. Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then he asked, then they asked For a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. When he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me, one is coming, the sandals of of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So this is what Paul does. He, He shares the story of the Israelites, 
up to the point to Jesus, right? He reminds them. He knows of this, right? He's a Jew that's been saved, right? Messianic Jew. He's been saved by grace. He knows Jesus. So he starts by looking at his audience, knowing that it's Jews, and he starts by telling them how Jesus is the promised Messiah. Jesus is the promised Savior. See, I think Paul does something really important that we need to take note of here. Before he even gets to explaining the gospel, he examined who he was speaking to, right? And he let it drive how he would share to them about Jesus. See, Gentiles wouldn't have cared about the Old Testament because they're not Jewish. See, the Jews relied heavily on the Old Testament and the prophets for their understanding of God, for their relationship with God, and being obedient to his commands. They knew that God had promised a savior that they would come and rescue Israel. A promise that they were all looking forward to and a promise that they were hoping for. So what does Paul do? He starts by connecting how Jesus is the promised savior. If there's any notes you wanna to take today, just remember Jesus is the promised savior. That's what he does in verses 23 through verse 25. God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he has promised. See, church family, Jesus isn't something that just randomly happened, right? God just randomly thought, oh, yeah, let's do this, right? They need saving, let's just do it, right? And it wasn't random. It was something that was promised to come since the beginning of the Bible. If you were to turn all the way to the beginning of your Bibles, to Genesis chapter 3, you would see something really important speaking of the prophecy of Jesus. This is after the fall of man. Adam and Eve had sinned. God meets them in the garden, knowing what they've done, knowing their nakedness, knowing that the serpent had deceived them. And this is what he says in proclaiming about what would happen and what would come, okay? Verse 14 of Genesis chapter three. It says, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, deceiving Adam and Eve, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is something we call proto-evangelium. This is the first gospel prophecy of Jesus to come. Knowing that Jesus did have to suffer, he did hang on the cross to the point where he died and Satan believed he won the victory. Darkness came over all the world when Jesus took that last breath. Satan believed that he had won. He had struck his heel and it was done. But no, this is what the scripture says, that Jesus would crush his head. The enemy would be defeated, and he was defeated when Jesus rose in victory from the grave. This is the gospel proclaimed right after Adam and Eve had fallen. From the very beginning, there's a golden crimson thread throughout scripture sharing and showing us that Jesus is promised. And he is coming and we need him. We need him to save us. See, Jesus is the offspring. He is the one who would feel the sting of death for the entire world. But he would and he did rise in victory. As promised, he fulfilled it. See, I believe you look at what Paul is doing here. If you want some evangelism tips, look at how Paul connects it all together, right? how he pieces the puzzle together to the crowd that he's speaking to and how we're relating the gospel to people, right? We don't want to take away from the gospel, don't want to add to the gospel. No, you share the gospel, what Jesus has done. But help your audience hear it. Help it relate to them. This is what Paul does in the very beginning. But look back at verses 26 through 31 of Acts chapter 13. This is where the core of his message, I believe his sermon hits. So this is what he does, verse 26. He starts by announcing, he says, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. What he does, he gives the reason for his encouragement. He gives the reason why he's standing up and speaking to them. What is it? To us has been sent the message of this salvation. 
that salvation has come. We don't have to look anymore. He is here, and his name is Jesus. That's what Paul is proclaiming to them. It's been here. It's come. His name is Jesus. Have you ever had something really important in your life that you wanted to share with as many people as possible? Right? Something really awesome that happens to you. I don't know if it was like when you got a car, when you got a new job, uh, when you got married, when you were engaged. A lot of people, you know, think of engagement, right? Think of engagement, people celebrate it. And they don't want to just tell their family. They want to tell the entire world. They want to show the entire world of their confession to each other and their relationship with each other. Right? Marriage, expecting it, hoping for it. It's good news of great joy, Right? You think about what Paul is doing here. He wants us to understand what is so important about this message. Something great has happened. It is good news of great joy, not just for some people, but for all people. And he could not help but share it. He was so excited, could not help but share it. See, he didn't want to miss how important this was. So he called everyone in. And shared him this great news that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Church family, let me ask you today a challenge question that I have to ask myself. Is this how I feel about my faith? Am I excited? Am I grateful? Have I truly been changed by this message? And I look at my life and go, If Jesus is the best thing to ever happen to me, am I living that? Am I sharing that with others? You see, if we truly say that the news of God's salvation, that Jesus has come, is the most exciting news on the planet, the greatest news we had ever received, shouldn't we share it? Okay, and I know that seems like a rhetorical question. Like, you you know the answer. So what I want you to do this morning is just consider reprioritizing the things that we tend to share more than the good news of great joy that will be for all people in Jesus Christ. The people should be able to see Jesus in us and hear Jesus in us. As we go into our workplaces, as the students and teachers and faculty go back to school, and those limitations and things you can and can't say, I understand that, but you can love like Jesus. And you can live like Jesus. You can love kids like Jesus. But is that something we're doing? Think of personally, am I doing that in my life, in my faith? Am I doing that with my family? Am I doing that with my children? Am I doing that with my neighbors? Am I doing that with those sitting next to me in church? Those not at church? Those at the store? Those at the restaurant? Wherever you are, you church family, listen, you have good news of great joy. Do not forget it. It's for all people. Do not be afraid to share it. So today I want to encourage you, remember what Jesus has done. Remember the wonderful truth that there is someone who hung on a tree on your behalf, who died for you, took your place, and rose again and gave you life. That you don't have to live your life burdened by the weights of the world anymore. You don't have to live your life hopeless anymore. No, Jesus is here and is sharing this grace and hope and mercy and says, all you need to do is depend upon me. Believe upon me. Don't live your life on your own anymore. Don't try to work your own way and do it yourself. No, trust upon me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just trust me. And I don't know about you, but I believe the world desperately needs to see that. I'm going to be transparent with you today. I I am in no way a perfect man. I am wretched in many ways, but God in his grace has saved me. We've got to share this. It's going to take all of us, not just some of us. It's going to take all of us. Because all of you are in very different places from everyone else. God has placed you where you are to be that light that Pastor Rick has been talking about over these past several weeks. To be that salt, to be that hope. Your parents can't live out your faith for you, students. You have to decide it for yourself. It's personal. 
personal to us. So today I want to encourage you, remember this good news of great joy. Don't let what the world says limit your excitement. Don't let momentary things take away your joy. No, you share that good news of great joy. So what does Paul do all throughout the rest of those verses? 27 through 31, he gives us this opportunity to remember what Jesus has done for us. In the next several verses, what he does in verses 32 through verse 37, he says this, And we bring to you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. What Paul does here, he links together the puzzle piece, right? The prophecies of Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. He starts with Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. He says, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's about Jesus. Verse 34, he says, and as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. That's from Isaiah 55, verse 3. In verse 35, therefore he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. He pieces again. He wants them to know this, this is the Messiah. He has come. This is what Scripture has spoken about, and he has fulfilled it all. But that main challenge, that main question that resonates through the heart of his message and today is, do you believe it? Do you believe in what he has done? Do you have faith in what he's done? Are you fully convinced of what Jesus has done for us? What does Paul do? He shares the gospel He gives them an opportunity to make a choice. Is this some reality that you've heard a hundred times or thousands of times since you were younger? Is it something that is real and personal to you? You've chosen, you've decided to follow Jesus. You see, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't hear the gospel growing up. Okay, I was 14. A friend invited me to come to youth. And I heard the gospel for the very first time, and, and I was broken, I was shameful, I had things I was addicted to, things I was struggling with. And in that moment, I was set free from those things, not becoming perfect, I was not perfect, but I was set free from shame, from guilt, from brokenness. I was changed. Have you experienced That change, that new life. Have you been set free? Jesus today, listen to me, church family. He is running today for you to know the love and grace that he's given. To be set free. To not live burdened by the weight of the world. As you struggle, you struggle well for his glory. Will you believe that? So what does Paul do? He ends his message. Looking at verse 38 and verse 39. By inviting them to believe upon Jesus. He says, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man's forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. How does Paul finish? He finishes by pointing that that no goat, no ram, no bull that is sacrificed would ever give us eternal life or eternal forgiveness. The only one who is the true lamb and the sacrifice that pays for the sins of the entire world of all time for all people is Jesus Christ. It's him. He is the one. Jesus alone grants us that eternal forgiveness for our sins. So we're set free, not by our own actions, not by what we can do, not by being good or doing certain things. We're set free by Jesus' finished work on the cross. That's why he goes to emphasize verse 39, and we'll finish. It says this, And by him, Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from everything. 
from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Here is the truth. Jesus sets us free. Are you experiencing the freedom in Christ? I'm not saying times are not difficult. I'm not saying we won't go through struggles. We've all seen our share of struggles even in this past year. We walk through those storms and the Lord walks with them with us, through them with us. You will see your share of storms and see your share of struggles, but the eternal hope that you have in knowing that you have been set free by the blood of Jesus will be your motivation in every storm, every storm that you face. So church family, today, I want to encourage you and even go to beg you, come to Jesus. Even today, if that's a message that you've heard since you were young and you've believed since you were young, or a message maybe you've heard for the very first time and something clicked, I pray today you would understand. Come to Jesus. Let him set you free. Let him give you life. This is the message that he's not only given to us, but he's given to the entire world for us to share his grace and his mercy. May we be the church in this community, may we be the teachers in this community, may we be the people in this community that not only love the Lord Jesus, but love people and are willing to share that good news of great joy with all. Come to Jesus. He can change your life. He can set you free.